horrific and avoidable. The Honduran prison fire disaster has not only exposed the appalling state of the country's jails, but also lifted the lid on the complete breakdown of Honduran law and order. So who's to blame? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lisa Fletcher. Human rights groups say it was an all too predictable tragedy. A chronically overcrowded prison looked after by only a handful of guards with just one set of keys between them. The result? The deaths of more than 350 inmates when an inferno tore through the Comayawa prison in Honduras last week. Honduran authorities were quick to blame the fire on a crazed inmate, but they've since backtracked and left many questions unanswered over the cause of the tragedy and the conduct of staff during it. Since then, the anger of victims' relatives has grown, fueled by the revelation that more than half of the inmates had never been either charged or convicted. It's the country's third major deadly fire in a decade. Analysts say the disaster not only points to the terrible state of Honduran prisons, but also exposes the steep rise in corruption and human rights abuses since the 2009 coup that deposed the democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya. It's a situation that has led to calls to end U.S. assistance for police and military forces inside Honduras. Our correspondent, Andy Gallagher, has this from another prison in Marcala, Honduras. Well, this is typical of any jail here in Honduras. You can see that the conditions are fairly inhumane. The beds are stacked three high all the way up to the ceiling. And in the ceiling, you can see those exposed electrical cables. Just the slightest spark here would set this place on fire in no time at all. As for the prison population itself, they are fed by the government on less than a dollar a day. And there are murderers, rapists and gang members in here. But there are also lots of people who've never been tried or convicted or others who've just carried out petty crimes like illegal chopping firewood. The man who runs this jail tells me, and he's not scared about telling me, that he feels completely abandoned by the government. This, of course, is typical of any of Honduras's 24 prisons. So what's gone wrong in Honduras? With me in the studio to discuss this is Peter Hakim, President Emeritus at the Inner American Dialogue. Next to him, Jose Miguel Vivanco, the Latin America Program Director at Human Rights Watch. And from Mountain View, California, Dana Frank, an expert on Honduran history at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the contributing writer for The Nation magazine. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. I, I want to start with the incident, the questions surrounding it, the reports that we're hearing from families and victims who escaped the fire. Dana Frank, talk about the inconsistencies in the stories that we're hearing uh, from the government and what, in your opinion, were the most inexcusable things that happened um, on Tuesday the 14th when this fire broke out? Well, Hondurans are calling this state-sponsored genocide at this point. Uh, the, the, um, the Lobo government, to its horrific discredit, immediately said, well, these were hardened criminals and that a pot and an inmate had set fire to his own mattress. And, you know, it's become very clear that this was not in any way an accident and even calling it a tragedy, on, uh, sorry, I think erases the fact that this was increasingly clear that it was deliberate and certainly not an accident. Um, these prisons are tremendously, this particular prison was supposed to hold 850, it had 250 inmates in it. We're now learning that there was only one guard that had the keys. There were only two in the prison at the time with 850 people in there and four guards met, uh, staffing the towers. So when the fire broke out, the prisoners were locked into their cells and the guard fled. P people are alleging that the guard fled and threw the keys down and people were trapped in the cells and uh, were trapped as the firefighters were arriving outside and the police wouldn't let the firefighters in for 30 minutes while the prisoners were screaming in their in their cells inside. And I want to underscore that uh, the Honduran police are the guards in these prisons. There's not a separately trained staff of prison guards. Um, people are testifying now that they smelled gasoline outside and, the, and also that tanks of gas were brought in by the guards before the fire. 
We also have this on, on video footage that people filmed that the police shot tear gas and bullets. We don't know if they're rub rubber or live bullets at the families that were arriving in horror at what was happening to their loved ones inside. So this is about as unimaginable a horror as you can get. I really want to underscore that this was not an accident. This was a really horrific act of criminal in, uh, negligence or deliberate attack by the police against the Honduran people. And we now know that most of those prisoners had never been charged or convicted of crimes. They were certainly not the hardened criminals that the government was immediately saying. And a lot of these people were just picked up by the police. Some of them were actually members of the opposition and, and were trapped in these prisons um, with waiting court dates that never arrived. Uh, Jose Miguel Vivanco, the implication here is that this may have been done intentionally by the guards. In terms of the information you're receiving, is that, is that a possibility? Uh, I think it's quite premature to make those type of um, uh, allegations. We don't have uh, all the facts yet. Um, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission is sending a delegation to Honduras, and hopefully they will be able to establish the, what happened here. But, uh, but I agree with Dana uh, in, in, with regard to that, uh, the, uh, the fact that this was uh, a result of uh, tremendous negligence on the part of, uh, of the government of Honduras, which is actually it's not an isolated case. The, the, the tragedy that we are uh, facing now, but also the conditions of prisoners uh, in Central America and in other places in, in South America are pretty similar. Uh, these uh, prisoners are living in worse conditions than animals without any internal uh, protection regulation. Uh, they don't have any um, support from the from the state. This is a result of, uh, of public security policies that are based on uh, on a misconception of iron fist and uh, manipulation of the sentiments of insecurity of the vast majority of a population that is facing these uh, gangs and and cartels in Central and South America. So what politicians normally offer is a cheap solution to just lock these people there for the rest of their life. Who cares whether they are already convicted or they are just uh, waiting trial? I want to get back to that iron fist attitude in just a second, but let's look at some of the numbers. Overcrowding played a major factor contributing to the high number of deaths in Honduras. Uh, the Comayawa National Penitentiary was intended to house 400 inmates, and Dana's even suggested that it's only been built to house up to 200 or 250, but its prison population was 852 at the time of the fire. Honduran courts face a backlog, meaning most of the inmates haven't been convicted of a crime, and that is a trend across the country's 24 prisons that have a total maximum capacity of 8,000 inmates, but currently 13,000 people are incarcerated. Nearly half await verdicts on their court cases. The U.S. State Department weighed in last April in a report citing human rights groups that said Honduran prisoners suffered from severe overcrowding, malnutrition, and a lack of adequate sanitation. Peter Hakem, I want to go to you and follow up on what Jose Miguel was saying in terms of an iron fist. A couple of years ago, there was a shift in Honduran law where they were really cracking down on gang members. They doubled the prison penalty for people who were convicted of being the leader of a gang. But it seems like that law has been rather loosely interpreted by the police. Talk about how that has led to part of the overcrowding problem? Well, I mean, I think you have to put this in perspective. Uh, you know, there's been, of the top 10 prison fire deaths in, I mean, over the years, six of them have occurred in Latin America, and three of those occurred in Honduras in the earlier years. Uh, secondly is that the prison populations, as Jose Miguel said so accurately, are treated badly in virtually every country of Latin America, save none. Uh, one of the uh, huge uh, disasters, prison disasters from a fire was in Chile, which is supposed to be one of the more progressive democracies in the region. This is not isolated within Honduras. This is a common phenomena of judicial systems, police uh, systems, uh, prisons that are overcrowded, poorly managed, and basically very, very brutal, close to being centers of torture just by the living conditions in which the prisoners exist. 
And uh, one needs a, a lot of change in, in, in there, and it's very hard in countries that have weak institutions, high crime rates, people screaming uh, very loudly for, to, to, for the government to protect them. And it's not surprising. We have this same reaction in the United States during a period when, you know, Nixon and law and order was the, and so uh, this is not a surprising phenomena and it's gonna happen in other prisons as well throughout Latin America. While it's not surprising, we're looking at 24 prisons in Latin America where a congressman from the ruling National Party recently said, this is happening in all of the prisons. It's not just isolated to this one or to a few. It's happening in all of them. And as you really do have to look at Honduras over here. Go, I, I go think ahead, the Mano Duro, the hard iron fist policies were very specific to Honduras and other countries, but I think that's letting Honduras off the hook. You know, they specifically had two prison fires in 2003 and 2004 in which police have been, were found to have killed gang members were, and were found to have been negligent in a fire that killed 104 in San Pedro Sula in 2004. In, uh, all the, and also, that, I think that really lets the Honduran post-coup government off the hook. For example, Daniel Orellano, who was head of the prison system until the day after the, the, day after the fire, was himself, according to Lobo, the, the Honduran government's own so-called Truth Commission, was head of the police at the time of the coup, which is in charge of rounding up political prisoners at the time of the coup. And this man has known exactly what the situation is in the prisons. He hasn't denounced it. And somebody like that was allowed to be in power by the ongoing coup government. So just, I think just to say it's just, it's true, this is terrible in other parts of Latin America. But let's really focus on the, the responsibility of the ongoing coup regime in Honduras who has known exactly about this situation and, and not resolved it. In fact, allowed it to get worse and worse. Uh, you know, uh, the spokesman for the UN Agency on Human Rights weighed in on the prison fire last week, uh, Robert Colville. He warned that these events reflect an alarming pattern of prison violence in the entire region, which is a direct consequence of or aggravated by a range of endemic problems, including chronic prison overcrowding, the lack of access to basic services such as adequate floor space, potable water, food, health care, and a lack of basic sanitary and hygienic standards. That would seem to indicate reasons for revolt from within the prison, rioting or maybe an inmate setting fire, uh, you know, in complete discontent for the conditions they're living in, which is different from what you're saying, Dana. You're saying that this was intentionally done and it was not caused by the prisoners, but the prison guards. Can we have a little conversation about which is I'm more likely that was here? Allegedly, I want to make it clear that it was allegedly, allegedly the prize, okay? And, in a, and let's remember that it was the prisoners that died here that were locked in at the time of the fire with, no, with not access to themselves to the keys. Look, let me just say, I, I don't think we should let anybody off the hook. The point is a lot more people deserve to be on the hook and the fact is, this is going to be repeated, just like we see natural disasters in Central America turn out much worse than natural disasters in other places where people don't prepare, they let abuses continue, and be assured, this is going to happen. It happened in Chile two years ago. It's happened in Brazil with prison riots. It wasn't a fire, prison riots. Or I don't remember how many were killed in the prison riots. The prisons in Latin America are horrible. The Human Rights Commission of the OAS ought to be investigating every prison in Latin America. Talk to Mexicans, talk to Honduras. I don't want to let anybody off the hook. The fact is, everybody is disregarding. They don't care about their prisoners. And, and prisons in Latin America are, I would say, unfortunately, a fantastic magnet for uh, organized crime and for additional, um, I mean, increase uh, the level of uh, of criminality and insecurity. Uh, there are many cases of uh, individuals who are just in pre-crime detention. You know, just they haven't been charged or, or sentenced yet uh, for you know any crime, and they happen to be there uh, for a minor violation, sometimes related to drug trafficking, but a, uh, you know a very very minor minor offense. And uh, in order to survive, they need to join um, a mafia, a gang internally that could offer protection. And, um, and, and what, what you could see in Honduras, as well as in the rest of, uh, of the region, is uh, a total abdication from the uh, government and from the political class to, to establish any kind of uh, uh, internal regulation or protection for you know, those prisoners who are 
even uh, in pretrial detention and, and, and deserve protection uh, from, from, from the, the, the gangs who are normally running the show uh, internally in, 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 in these prisons. Um, in many of these places, what the government does is to offer security for the external perimeter of the, of the, of the prison. And to and, and to let the, you know anything goes inside this uh, the, the place with tremendous overcrowding and, and inhuman conditions without taking any responsibility. Why has the government given up responsibility for these prisons? I, I mean, I want to underscore that in the case of Honduras, there's definitely this kind of uh, corrupt activity inside the prisons. But met, it, it, what's been going on in the last fall is it's very clear that there is not a line between here's the Honduran government, here's the police, and here's the corruption inside the prisons, that those are all interlocked. There's been a huge scandal that's erupted all fall because in October 22nd, the police admitted that the chief suspects killi killed were police that killed the son and friend of the university rector on October 22nd and allowed the suspects to go free. In the aftermath, there's been this huge scandal about corruption among the Honduran police. The government at the very top has admitted that this is a huge problem. And a, a poli former police commissioner um, charged that the very top of the police were involved in drug trafficking and political assassinations of the opposition. He himself, Alfredo Landa Verde, was assassinated on December 6th. This is a tremendous crisis for the basic security situation in Honduras. And they're now talking about cleaning up the police, but the same people that are supposed to clean up the police are the ones that are being charged as the corrupt ones that are in bed themselves with the drug traffickers. And many, some, one possibility um, is that this fire was a pushback against the cleanup of the police. Um, they did, uh, you know, we do know that Londa Verdi was assassinated right after he made these charges, and also the day before a prominent newscaster. Luis Marina Paz was assassinated on December 5th. So all of this is happening in a context of a Lisa, spectacular you, uh, scandal about uh, police corruption and police pushback against the I'm so, uh, against any potential cleanup. I'm sorry, then, if I may, uh, Le um, Lisa just asked a question about what this, why the state has b abandoned the it's prison system. Yeah. The responsibilities in the prison system. Well, it's, um, politically speaking, it's not very profitable to uh, represent the interests of the prisoners. Uh, as a matter of fact, every time that you raise this question, as even as part of a, a reasonable public security policy, um, uh, politicians usually manipulate the, uh, the, 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 the fear of uh, insecurity of a population by arguing that those ones who are concerned with prison conditions are fighting for five-star hotels for the prisoners. That did not you know, look like a five-star hotel that we well, saw in our opening yeah, sequence. Yeah, and unfortunately, the, the president of, uh, of Honduras, uh, Mr. Lobo, mm -hmm. is on the record when he was uh, president of Congress, um, arguing that uh, uh, prisoners, uh, as a result of the new code of criminal procedure, uh, received uh, more uh, human rights or more protection for their fundamental rights than innocent uh, citizens who are the majority of uh, in Honduran uh, of, of, of the Honduran population. So that type of line, that type of statements, are extremely unfortunate. Uh, is the kind of line that uh, really doesn't help. Can I? Can I ask? I, I'd like to ask Dana and uh, Jose Miguel a question. Uh, Jose Miguel is the expert on prisons and human rights. Dana is certainly the expert on Honduras. We know what the situation is. It's terrible in Honduras. The prisons are awful. The judicial system is corrupt. The police are corrupt. The president is part of a system that's corrupt. What does one do? What can be done? What sh should the U.S. sort of argue for a U.N. trusteeship? What is, what well, is to be Dana, done? Dana, maybe you can put this into a larger context for us in terms of what's going on politically with Honduras and the U.S. relationship to Honduras. Well, you know, I do want to underscore that the Lobo government came to power in an election that was completely bogus. It was boycotted by almost all international observers, and most of the opposition pulled out. The votes were counted by the same people who perpetrated the coup, and the same military figures are still in power. People like Daniel Oriana that had the prisons until 
until last week um, were, were put in top positions in the government. So this is what we have to call an ongoing coup regime that has, is very much supported by the Obama administration. I want to underscore that U.S. military funding has gone up every year since the coup. They're now spending $50 million to make the so-called temporary barracks at Soto Cano Air Force Base in Honduras permanent. So the Obama administration has, as it has known all this corruption, very clearly has been pouring more and more money in. And some of this is militarization of the whole region in the name of fighting drugs, when actually really it's about the U.S. shoring up this repressive regime in order to expand U.S. military presence in Central America. The Honduran human rights community will be the first to say, we don't want this kind of militarization. The rector of the university, whose son was killed allegedly by the police, has said, stop feeding the beast, stop that the United States and other countries should stop sending police and military aid. And they're saying, let us, and at this point, why they want an international commission, they want the UN in there with Hondurans who are experts on police and prison cleanups. They do not want the United States escalating its military and police control in the United States in the name of some kind of cleanup. And they've been very, very clear about that. And Miguel, we really, they, I think, have to address back what they're saying. They know, um, um, the, the good news is that Congress has uh, included some human rights conditions to uh, military and police aid to, yeah. to Honduras. And that, I think, is, um, is very, very useful. To, to, to condition this bilateral relation to certain benchmarks. So you're saying this is not a blank check the Obama administration's giving to Honduras? Well, 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 well you know, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Congress, right, okay. Dana? I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, we, yeah we, exactly. There's two different sides to this. One okay, Dana, hang on. Let, let, Jose which, yeah. let Jose Miguel finish his thought here. No, no, no. The, the, the idea is that uh, if we are going to be providing some training uh, for the police and, uh, and, 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 and the army in Honduras and any other security force there, that needs to be strongly conditioned on specific human rights uh, requirements, mm -hmm. uh, benchmarks, uh, benchmarks that could be assessed every few months. And um, so therefore that relationship is subject of uh, public scrutiny. Um, otherwise, I don't see a way to, uh, for a country as uh, poor and uh, with uh, this deep problem as uh, Honduras to, to move forward. Let me, let me just also add one other thing, in other words, that taking away money from the military is not going to solve Honduras's deep problems. Poverty, inequality, uh, brutality. I mean, these are a crime and violence, which, I mean, the question is it's still what to do, which I really haven't heard. I've heard what not to do. And maybe the U.S. shouldn't be take the leadership in this. Uh, and certainly the U.N. has done a good job in Haiti in restoring some degree of law and order. And maybe there should be a peacekeeping force in Haiti. Uh, but certainly uh, the Haitian judicial system hasn't improved at all uh, by not having the U.S. take the leadership. And in, in a real sense, uh, and uh, Dana, you mentioned that the election was not uh, accepted by anybody except the United States. Well, every Central American government, except for uh, Nicaragua, accepted the election, in fact. Uh, the regional no, governments all accepted. said that it was accept acceptable. Canada accepted that election. I want to make that clear. They would, did not recognize the election and yes, they did they, not support. Yes, Honduras they did. The yes, they did. I want to. I want to also say that the Hunter, that that military funding is going to pour in a repressive regime. This is like funding Pinochet after the coup in Honduras. Mm -hmm. Why would we want to be pouring money to arm this regime, the police and the military? You know, back to the I congressional think you're thing. You're exaggerating, I want to Dana. That the, that the I think Senate you're exactly. I was there in Chile the during funding. the coup. I think you're exaggerating. Well, I think that they this would be the is not a government both like the Pinochet situations. government. Jose They're Miguel, war, I guess, on, on. Uh, do you have any reasons for optimism here, and maybe a pathway forward? Um, uh, look, um, I'm quite skeptical that um, that uh, something, uh, you know, that the, the policies are going to significantly change. Uh, we have seen this before in Honduras, and this is not just Honduras. To you know, this week we were witnessing a similar case in Mexico, right. in Nuevo León. Uh, Forty-four prisoners uh, die in a piece of prison riots, and um, so this is uh, foreseeable and this is avoidable. But um, to to confront this problem, 
you need to develop the right type of uh, public policies and uh, in terms of security and uh, and this is actually extremely expensive you know you can get uh, some you know shortcuts or you know solutions uh, uh, overnight uh, it will require you know um, a lot of funding in terms of training in terms of uh, providing the replacing these decrepit uh, buildings where we are um, uh, you know, uh, where there is a tremendous overpopulation of uh, prisoners and, and change of a, on, the, on the criminal law mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it is a, a big challenge and, um, and, and hopefully this, um, the shock that this has created in Honduras and, mm -hmm. and, and, and internationally is going to help to promote some serious change, but I'm not terribly optimistic. All right. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's going to do it for the Inside Story team from Washington, D.C. And Thanks don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about our program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net.